Do you want your audience to listen or to learn? Hello, I'm Malcolm Cox and welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips. This is episode number 212. And today we're talking about how to make the most of congregational involvement when we preach or teach. See, there's all the difference in the world between a congregation listening to what you have to say as opposed to learning what you're trying to convey. We've all been there, haven't we? We've been there as an audience member, listening, but not really learning. And perhaps you felt like I have, sometimes the frustration of being a speaker and realizing that you might have put across some good material, but has it really sunk in? Has it, been, has it, found, has it found its usefulness? And I would say that congregational involvement in our teaching and preaching is part, not the only part, but part of how we ensure that people not only listen, but learn something useful that they can take away. And it'll be a blessing to them and the people around them. So this is the ninth lesson, uh, class number nine, in the series, They Tell of the Glory of Your Kingdom and Speak of Your Might, from Psalm 145, verse 11. The basic preaching and teaching course for men or women, and thank you again to my friends in the Philippines for suggesting this, and I hope it's been useful and helpful for you. So we've had an introductory class, nine main classes, including this one today. We've got one more main class, which I'll talk about a bit later, and then a summary wrap-up class. So where are we so far in our class series? What have we done? We have chosen our text. For me, I've chosen Luke chapter 7, the uh, raising of the widow's son back to life by Jesus. We've explored it, dug into it. We've looked at other resources like commentaries. We found the main point, which for me is Jesus loves to help. Simple, but that's my main point. You've chosen a structure, introduction, some sub points, a conclusion. You've planned how to start your lesson. You've written that compelling introduction that will grab people's attention and help them to see the relevance of what you're going to be talking about. You've also now planned your conclusion so that you can not only drive the point home, but help people to come to a conviction and a conclusion for themselves of what this means for them. And now you've added also your illustrations, which we talked about last time. And if you haven't watched that, that's Teaching Tip 211 about the best way to use illustrations and things like illustrations to bring your message alive and help it to sink in. Today, congregational involvement. Now, I looked back through my YouTube channel feed and realized that this isn't the first time I've talked about this. In teaching tip number 193, 193, I have one there called Secrets of the Interactive Sermon. I really enjoyed putting that together. I remember doing it. I think you'll find that useful. So if you want to, go back to that. I'll put a link in the show notes. Episode 193, Secrets of the Interactive Sermon. And that's focused very much specifically on the use of questions in our sermons, interactive questions, not rhetorical questions, not the kind of questions where you ask a question then answer it yourself, but ones where you, where you expect other people to answer the questions. And I focus on how Jesus did that. And so I'm going to try not to duplicate that uh, teaching tip this time. You can go back and have a look at that. Today we're going to look at a few other tips, um, practicals, and uh, principles of the interactive sermon, and I hope it's going to be useful to you. And by the way, this, is, this material should be useful whether you're preaching a traditional Sunday sermon, whether it's a teaching class or a Bible discussion kind of group. The, the principles will apply in every single context, so I hope you'll find something useful. So, a few things to talk about today. Firstly, let's talk about the value of having interactivity in our lessons. You, this might not be part of your culture or your upbringing or what you feel good at, but there's great value in it. Firstly, because you get more engagement. If I'm sitting there and I know that the speaker is going to be asking me a question or might throw out a question for me and the rest of the congregation to wrestle with or answer or discuss, it, it tends to make me more, pay more careful attention. I, my, my input might be required. So you tend to get more engagement in that way. It also helps the kinetic learners or the experiential learners. There, there's a debate about learning styles and how relevant that is. But nonetheless, there are some of us who seem to learn better by doing. 
And if we're involved, we're involved in the discussion, involved in the trajectory of the lesson, we're involved in the ideas being expressed and explored, it helps those experiential learners to learn more deeply and more quickly for themselves. It helps those people. It also helps you as a speaker, because when you ask questions and engage in discussion with your, uh, your audience, you actually find out what they're thinking. I mean, you know what you're thinking. You might think you know what they're thinking, but you don't really know what they're thinking until you ask them and give them some space to express what they're thinking, what their questions might be. So you find out what people are really thinking. And the other good reason for doing this, I mean, this might be the most obvious of all, is that Jesus did it. Jesus delivered interactive lessons. He, if he thought it was a good idea, we probably should as well. And we're going to look at a few examples of Jesus as we go through the other points here. Secondly, let's talk about context. Before we get into the specifics of some examples, let's just say that depending on your context, different kinds of interactivity will be possible or preferable. For example, the size of your congregation will dictate some things. If you've got 20 people, that's quite a different context to 2,000. You might be able to, as, as indeed I often do, if I'm in a congregational setting with 20 people, I'll throw out a question and I can hear what people are saying. If you've got 2,000, that might not be possible. There might be other things you can do with a bigger group, but you need to tailor what you do according to the size of the people, of the group of the people that you have at the time. Secondly, the shape of the room and the layout of chairs and tables makes also quite a big difference. So if you want to have small group work, you need to have chairs that will move so people can sit in groups. I, I often do this in our Watford church where uh, when we're meeting in a hall, I'll ask people to break into groups and rather than just twist round on their chair, I'd rather they move the chairs and sat in a small circle, uh, at least if it's more than a two minute discussion because that gives people the opportunity to see each other and interact when they're talking. So bear in mind that what you're going to do will depend a bit on the size and the shape of the room, whether the chairs are movable, that kind of thing. If we're talking about online things, and of course right now I'm recording this in the middle of COVID-19 and we're doing church online, we're doing it live. I know some congregations pre-record everything and that does work. Um, but I prefer to be live and since we only have a small group, it works for us to do everything live. And there we're learning how to use the chat box. We're using Zoom. We're learning how to use it. I don't think we've quite got the hang of all of it yet, but people are typing things in. I'm still finding it quite challenging to be speaking and paying attention to the chat box at the same time. However, if I ask a question and people put their thoughts in the chat box, I like that as I wait for people to put things there and then I'll read and comment on those for everybody. So everybody gets a chance to see or hear what someone's putting in the chat box. And it's important that I repeat what people are writing in there because although everybody else is online, some people are on a mobile phone, on a small tablet, and they're not, it's not easy for them to see what's in the chat box. So me repeating it makes quite a big difference for the sense of the, the whole group benefiting from other people's thoughts, which, uh, and those thoughts are often really spectacularly good and helpful. You have to use the unmute idea uh, carefully. You need to know who's on the call and you need to know how to handle it. And a lot of that just comes through experience. I would say, take a risk every now and again and ask people who want to share something, why don't you unmute yourself and share a thought? If you've got something to share with the whole group, please free, feel free to do that. I like doing that from time to time. Of course, sometimes people take liberties and go on for a very long time. Other times they may say something uncomfortable or unhelpful. I can't tell you how to prepare for that really, except that you can only learn how to deal with that by experience. Um, I don't know if you've ever been heckled. Uh, I don't like being heckled. It's only happened to me in a church congregation situation twice, at least another member of the church heckling me. This is a long time ago in a very different context. Uh, I, but I can't, there's no way to prepare for that. You have to experience it and, and deal with it as it comes up. Uh, I'm grateful to say that the two times it happened to me, I had the self-restraint not to argue with the heckler and some other members of the congregation. Uh, well, one time they just asked him to be quiet 
And the other time it just blew over and I moved on and it was fine. And we had a chat afterwards and, you know, this was just a disturbed person. I need to be sensitive to that. It's um, sometimes preaching and teaching is messier than we would like it to be, as Jesus found. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. So the context makes a big difference. Online, not online, the size of the room, whether you can move the chairs, all kinds of things. Thirdly, thirdly, congregational involvement in its most common form involves asking questions. Asking questions of the people that are there. Jesus did this all the time, didn't he? Now, there's a lot on that in the other teaching tips. I won't talk about the detail now, except for one example. Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. See how he drew out the thinking of the disciples here. What do people, what do people say? And then what do you say? And then Peter makes the great declaration. It's a teaching opportunity. No, it's not a sermon exactly, but it's a teaching opportunity. Jesus is using questions here to draw out the thinking of other people, to draw out the people that are uh, the thinking of the people that are with him, and then to make a point, which is very powerful, and we have it written down for evermore. Now, one of the things that, ha that helps with questions, that this came up in a conversation I was having with my friend Ben about the best way to, uh, to get good answers to questions. I mean, firstly, you've got to ask a good question and make it an open question, not a yes or no question. Did Jesus love people? Well, yes, that's, but that's not a good question. So, so there are a couple of things to do with uh, asking questions. The so first is where you can preview the question in advance so people know it's coming. If someone dumps a question on me, suddenly I'm not expecting it. What do you think about this? I haven't got time to think. I need time to process that. And then before I know it, three other people have answered the question and we've moved on and I'm still thinking about what I think is the answer. Preview the question. How can you do that? A number of ways. If you've got a screen, put it on the screen before you ask. Put it up there even a minute before you ask the question. So it's there, perhaps behind you, people can see it and they know the question is coming. Or put it on a handout. I like sending out handouts. Send out a handout in advance, perhaps even a week ahead. I send out sometimes my sermon handouts two or three days or even a week in advance if I can and there are questions on there and I'll tell people I'm going to ask these questions, they can be praying about it, thinking about it all week long. Or you may have noticed recently one of the things I've started doing more this year is previewing the Sunday sermon online on Facebook Live usually and maybe on the Monday I might sit there and, and start a Facebook Live and say this Sunday we're talking about Psalm 133 as it is this Sunday for Watford here are some questions I've got about it. What do you think? And so if people are watching that on Facebook, they've got time to think about the questions before we get there on Sunday. So preview the questions whenever you can. And as I said, there's more on questions in the previous teaching tips. So I'll, I'll stop there, but ask questions. Brilliant way to get excellent congregational involvement. Number four, be interruptible. If you're going to make the most of congregational involvement, you need to learn how to be appropriately interruptible. What do I mean by this? Well, let's take Jesus as an example in Luke 11, verses 27 and 28. It says, as Jesus was saying these things, so he's in the middle of teaching, preaching. As he was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He had, a, he had a bit of heckling here, positive heckling, but interrupted him. Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. That what presumably was not part of his plan that day. It wasn't part of his lesson. So what does he do? Does he shut her down? Does he tell her to be quiet? Does he ignore what she says? No. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. 
He used the interruption to make a great point. He uh, affirmed, I think, the lady's comment, even though it, he didn't quite contradict it, but he certainly took it in a different direction, but he used it to make a point. It's important that we're interruptible. I know most of the time we like to deliver our lessons without interruption, and we maybe fear the interruption because we don't know quite where it's going to go. And maybe you don't feel trained for that. And again, I don't think there really is much in the way of training. You just have to learn it by doing it and experiencing it. And then you learn the lessons. People can give you feedback as to whether you did well with it or not afterwards. But we do need to be flexible. I would say our sermons need to be flexible. One of the key skills to develop as a speaker is to know when on the fly to cut stuff out. I always, I would say 90% of the time, I have more material to speak on than I'm, than I'm actually gonna get through. And I pretty much always leave something out. It might be an illustration, it might be an extra scripture, it might be an extra point. But that's important to, to learn how to become flexible. And when we're interrupted, it might take up some time, but it could be exactly what's needed. At the end, of, near the end of one of my sermons not long ago, and I think I may have mentioned this on the previous video about this, um, a, a, a chap was sitting there in the front row, and just as I was wrapping up, I was beginning my conclusion, he just put his hand up and asked a question. And it was connected with the scriptures we were talking about, but it wasn't connected with the point. And I didn't shut him down, I answered his question, and then I went back to my conclusion, but I wrapped it up a bit more quickly. Afterwards, he told me that was the most helpful thing in the whole lesson, even though it wasn't directly connected with my point. So I helped him by being interruptible and being flexible. So are you flexible? Are you interruptible? We all need to be to some extent. Fifthly, group work. Interactivity can include group work as part of your lesson. Again, an example from Jesus, Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. Yes, you might not believe it, but Jesus did group work. Let's see this example. I think you'll like this. Matthew 21, Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And... Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also, also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. So here is his topic for their group work. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? And he basically gives them this group work to do. Okay, you group of, who do we have here again? Chief priests, elders of the people. They approach him, they ask him a question. He asks them a question. He says, why don't you go away and talk about this as a group and come back and give me your thoughts? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet. So you see how they wrestled with the question. They really thought about it. I mean, this helped deepen their understanding of what they themselves were thinking. And that's kind of the point with group work, to be honest. It's not so much the answer you come up with as the fact that you've learned how to think about the question better and the issue. Anyway, they do that. Then they come back to him and they answer him, we don't know. <laughs> well, whether they knew or not, they weren't telling, but that's what they, they came back with, we don't know. Then he said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. It's a, it's a little humorous, but it is group work, isn't it? And the purpose was clear. Jesus had the purpose of helping them to think through what they really thought. And he was hoping perhaps that they would come to uh, a more humble position. It didn't work out that way, but at least they had a chance. They had an opportunity. So giving people group work to do is a great thing to do occasionally in lessons send them off into small groups. I would suggest the smaller the better. Three or four is usually better than five, six, seven. Otherwise, there's not enough time for everybody to share or listen. Make it clear what the purpose of the group is. In other words, is it a discussion 
or is it asking for the answer to a question? So sometimes you'll give a group some work as a question like Jesus does here, I've got a question for you, and you're asking them to come up with an answer and you want them to come back and share that answer. But other times you want them just to discuss it. Why don't you discuss this question or this topic and see what you learn from each other? And then they might come back as a group and share what they've learned together and from each other, but it's not exactly an answer to a question. So make it clear because it, a discussion is quite different, a discussion about a topic is quite different from trying to find an answer. So what is your group trying to do? Have a good enriching discussion or find an answer to a question? Give people a time limit with this, whether it's three minutes or five minutes or whatever it is, make it clear. What you might want to do is set a timer. I set a timer sometimes on my phone so that they, when it goes off, everybody can hear it. Or if I'm using slides, I might put a timer on the, uh, on the PowerPoint slide, the keynote slide, and then they can see the, count the, thing um, the, the, the timer counting down, which is visual and that can be quite useful. You can find those on, on YouTube uh, or somewhere quite easily. And, or, and of course, doing group work, you could give them materials like post-it notes or a flip chart. If it's a very big group, you might ask them to text in their answers or their thoughts to somebody who has uh, the ability to write stuff down for you and you might read that out or somebody else might do that. Group work is fascinating. Let me tell you one story I heard which I really liked, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a twist on this and um, a kind of an advanced version of this. And it's not something you could do with probably a traditional normal sermon, but you might be able to do it in some context, which is the idea of giving people experiences. And this, I think, comes under the group work idea. There was a chap who was training some other speakers, in fact, and he had a small group of speakers and he, they spent the whole morning doing a training class. And he said, right, it's uh, time for lunch break, uh, but I've got something for you to do in your lunch break. And he gave each of them a five pound note. So I don't know what that would be in the Philippines or other parts of the world, but five pounds is enough for, um, what, two lattes or something like that, I suppose, in today's money. Depends where you buy your lattes, but one or two lattes. He gave them a five pound note and he said to them, uh, we're on the high street here. There was, it was a church building on a high street. He said, we're on the high street here. There's, there's a, two or three betting shops. I want you in your lunch break to go and place a bet. Take my five pounds and place a bet. And they looked at him horrified. But, but he was, you know, he was the man in charge. And so they said, okay. So during their lunch break, they all went out to the high street and each one of them went into the betting shops and put a five pound bet on something or other. End of the lunch break, they all come back and the chap leading the session says, did you place your bets? They said, we did. He said, what was it like? And each one of them in turn shared how difficult it was, how embarrassing it was, how awkward it was, because not one single one of them had ever been inside a betting shop. They'd never placed a bet. They didn't know, they'd never done it. And he said, what was it like? And they said, well, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know who to talk to. We didn't know the procedure. We didn't know where to start or what to, you have to fill in things and you have to give them in and you have to make a decision about what you're betting on and, and the odds and we just didn't know what we were doing. We felt lost and completely out of place. And he said, uh, he said, well, that's exactly how visitors feel when they come to your church. That's how they feel. And that experiential work help them to grasp something they never would have understood better any other way. That when visitors come to their church, they feel just like these people going off and placing a bet in a betting shop, which they'd never done before. And I love that story on lots of levels, but part of it is this experiential kind of learning. Maybe you can't do something exactly like that in your next sermon or class, okay. But I think it's important to think about the value of experiential learning and of group work and everything that goes with that that can help with congregational involvement going from just listening to actually learning. See, I remember that story even now. I expect you will for a very long time. 
So to finish off, let me think about the Luke chapter 7 passage that I've been looking at here and my title is, or my theme is, Jesus loves to help. The widow, her son, Jesus raises him from the dead. How might I involve a congregation here? Well, there's some questions you could ask. For example, how does it feel to be helped? In a very general sense, how do you feel when you're helped? Or more specifically, why do you think Jesus stopped this funeral? and not others. It can't have been the only funeral he saw in his 30 odd years on earth, right? Why did he stop this one and not the others? We don't know, but the discussion around that question might surface some thoughts. And my favorite question I've thought of for this one, what do you think the funeral bearers, the bearers of the coffin, what do you think the bearers were thinking? When Jesus stopped them and he touched it, and he said, stop. What do you think they were thinking? I love that because what it does, this question, is it makes the congregation start thinking from a different viewpoint. Most of us, we, we tend to view scripture from a distance, like it's over there somewhere. And one of the challenges for a preacher is not only do we need to get into the text, but our preaching should show people how to do it so that they can get inside it and experience it rather than just look at it as a piece of some words on paper and about theories and ideas. This is a story about something real that happened. If I can get inside the, the heart and the mind or walk in the feet of Jesus or the disciples or the widow or the son for that matter or the, or the bearers of the, uh, the dead son, I'm gonna have a much deeper understanding of what is really going on here. So that's a good question. Group work might be something like, do you think that when Jesus said, don't cry, when he said that, do you think that's insensitive or sensitive or why? Why would he say, don't cry? How would it feel to you? And you could have a group, group discuss that and come back afterwards. You could even have a debate. You could have two groups where one group argued that Jesus was being insensitive and another group could argue that he was not being insensitive and see what comes out of that. What comes out of these kinds of debates and discussions are fascinating and wonderful because they engage the imagination. And we need to do that to help our congregations, our listeners, engage their imagination. They will go away learning something rather than simply listening. You could even have a physical demonstration. <laughs> if you're brave, you could ask someone to be the dead son and get some people to carry a Maybe you bring a mat or something like that and get them to carry them and, um, and you could play the part of Jesus and stop it and demonstrate it physically like that. Congregational involvement. I love it. I love it. It's so important. And it's not used enough, in my opinion. Don't overdo it. Don't do, the, don't do a lot of stuff every single week. It gets old. But do something every now and again. What could you do maybe in your next lesson? That might be the question for today. Two questions for today. Number one, what could you do in your next lesson to improve congregational involvement? Even something simple. If you've not done it before, don't, don't shoot for the moon yet. Do something simple. What could you do in your next lesson? And secondly, uh, perhaps a group discussion, if you're doing this class series as a group, a group discussion would be something like, what have you seen done well regarding congregational involvement in the past? Think back to a time when you saw this done well what was it that was done well and why did it work? I think that's all we have time for today. This uh, one is long, the longest of all and I apologize for its length, but on the other hand, I think it's really important. Next time, we're going to be talking about how to prepare yourself to speak. Now we talked about preparing the lesson, but a speaker needs to prepare themselves. So we'll talk about that next week and then the following week we'll have a concluding summary class. So I'd really, I'd really like to ask you for your thoughts for that summary class. Like what questions do you have? What things have been raised over this nine week series so far? that's caused you to think about questions. Uh, send me some questions and I'll try and answer those in the summary class in two weeks time. Uh, you can email me, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. You can catch me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on my website where you can leave a message there. You can even leave a voicemail via my website, if you like, malcolmcox.org. So that's where that is. Once again, thank you to all of you that have been watching and listening. Thank you to my friends in the Philippines. I thoroughly enjoy doing these. I expect you can tell. 
But let's remind ourselves why we're doing this. We're not doing this just to be entertainers. We're doing this so that people not only listen, but learn, grow, and become the light for God that we all want to be. As it says in Psalm 145 verse 4, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Let's work at congregational involvement so that more and more people will tell of God's mighty acts. Till the next time, I hope you have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. Take care and God bless.